Okay, so welcome back from lunch, everyone. Hope you had an enjoyable lunch and an interesting set of uh, clinics in the morning. Um, for this uh, set of keynote talks, the first talk is gonna be given by Johannes Westring from the University of Notre Dame on the evolution of process and scale coupling in coastal ocean hydrodynamic modeling. Well, first off, thanks for the invitation. Um, and uh, I guess what I'd like to do is give our take on model integration model coupling and uh, some of the things that might be helpful as we uh, pave a path forward in this rap very rapid look, uh, rapidly moving business. Um, so uh, my co-authors Rick Ludick and Clint Dawson and I are the uh, original developers of uh, the ADSERC uh, coastal hydrodynamic model. So the processes that we're interested in are predominantly uh, the actual hydrodynamics of the coastal ocean, all the way from the uh, outer continental shelf to the estuarine systems, to the river systems and the adjacent coastal floodplain. Obviously the morphology is uh, tremendously important, uh, but we don't directly model its evolution. We do take it into account obviously through data ingestion as well as the ecology is important too. Um, but uh, we're, we're, we're really looking at the rich scales of the hydrodynamics. So looking at the processes of the ocean, it's incredibly rich in processes, and there's a variety of forcing mechanisms. But uh, we start off with tides, which are, uh, uh, of course, uh, gravitationally driven, uh, tsunamis tectonically driven, and then weather and uh, storms drive a lot of the circulation and energy in the ocean. And basically, we go from uh, global circulation engines to wind waves to storm surges and in between those you have microgravity waves and uh, then you have rainfall runoff and if you're going to model this stuff all you need to do as uh, Jenny said this morning is go to the Navier-Stokes equations and you're all set it, it covers everything uh, the only problem is you have to go from scales of thousands of kilometers down to kilometers and so I did a little back of the envelope calculation just for fun. And so you need to do 10 to the 34th unknowns per day of simulation time. And so I, I'd say roughly we can do 10 to the 12th to 10 to the 16th per day right now, but uh, we're way off from 10 to the 34th. So historically where this has gone, instead of solving Navier-Stokes, we've really compartmentalized processes and scales quite a bit. I think it's kind of fun to really look at the origins of this. Laplace actually predates uh, the uh, Stokes equations, and he came up with the LTEs, Laplace tidal equations, which are long wave equations that are non uh, for non dispersive processes. So they do a really good job at doing tides, tsunamis, for the most part anyway, and, and storm surges. So that's uh, that's really at the heart of a lot of uh, coastal ocean models. Then uh, you go next and say, okay. Uh, I want to deal with non-dispersive, uh, uh, dispersive type waves. And um, you go to Buzanet's class models and there's a whole variety of those. And of course they started off with Buzanet himself in the 1870s, uh, although most uh, modern theories are, are based on Peregrine in uh, 1967. And, and that covers waves, transforming waves, infragravity waves really well. And uh, for example, when uh, tsunamis are making their way on land. So next up, we have uh, dealing with waves in general in the ocean. There's just no way that you can resolve them sufficiently based on the length scales. You would just absolutely kill yourself. And uh, so uh, the, uh, the French actually in the 50s came up with wave energy transport type models, or wave energy density or a whole bunch of variants on that. And uh, the first really big operational model that was full physics based and allowed the spectrum to change was uh, known as Hasselman and company who uh, wrote the uh, RAM model. And that's a pretty widely used non-phase resolving wave model. So it doesn't give you the phase, but it gives you where wave energy is going. Then uh, next is Lighthill. He uh, uh, developed and derived the kinematic wave equation, dynamic wave equation for rainfall runoff. And those equations of course are used when, uh, when you're trying to do over very thin layer overland flows before you jump over the shallow water equations. Shallow water equations are extremely difficult in order to, uh, to resolve and compute those type of processes. And last but not least, you have global cir ocean circulation type models. 
really were, were initiated in the late 60s and have evolved and really focus on the global heat engine and the uh, bare chronicity of the ocean and a lot of the energy that exists in the ocean off the shelf. So really it's this scale separation, process separation, uh, and, and it's somewhat unfortunate that really all these communities live in a little bit of a silo. And uh, it's nice to see that they're finally coming back to work a little bit. And each one of the communities provides affordable resolution and covers the domain that they can. And, um, and they just alias the rest or forget about the rest and deal with it in boundary conditions. A lot of nesting goes on within these model classes. Um, I think uh, I'm always a little bit scared of nesting because you got to do it really right unless you have a really diffusive model. Uh, because that will kind of uh, wipe out your sins. But I think I'd like to make two points on nesting that uh, warrant uh, people have a little bit of caution. First of all, the boundary conditions are always the most inaccurate. Uh, they're typically lower order than the rest of the uh, PDE solutions inside of the domain. Um, and second of all, if there's any kind of uh, incongruity between the, the physics that you're forcing and the interior domain physics, you run into trouble unless, again, you have a pretty diffusive model. So either you get extra energy being generated because of the, the uh, mismatch between the interior and boundary energy, or you get stuff that's generated inside reflecting back. And you can just spend a lot of time with those boundary conditions. And last but not least, uh, you have the uh, data simulation. So we don't do th things right in our little process separated world. And of course, the rest of that energy exists out there. So, and, uh, and we can't resolve it enough, et cetera. We don't have a large enough domain, well, we'll just assimilate something. And uh, that has its own set of issues, but also it, uh, its own set of benefits. So really I'd say where we're coming from, enormous progress obviously since uh, these models have been developed, but uh, where, where we've been going is much more component interaction between the silos. Uh, I think uh, for me, I'm a planet element person, so Obviously, unstructured grids are great. Uh, you can really resolve things where, where you need to. And localized resolution, you can do large domains. And we are, as computer capacity just grows in this wonderful age of our profession, uh, better resolution and together with better algorithms. So the, the models today are a lot less numerically diffusive than they were in the past. And that goes right along with better subgrid scale physics, um, as well as improving parallelism. The bad is. Uh, We've got largely siloed communities still in development. Really, we were not talking enough to each other, in my opinion. Uh, the grids have just been very suboptimal. We really haven't put all the homework into that that we should. And if you look at what kind of models existed in the 60s, for example, for my business, shallow water equations, uh, they were kind of second order accurate. And for the most part, most models are still second order accurate today. And, and that doesn't match well with the uh, computer technology and often very inefficient parallel processing. So just to give you a little bit of a story about our model, that's at the ABSERC model. So look at the spectrum and where things are really energetic of the ocean. We have the uh, gravity waves between, let's say one and 30 seconds, then you have infragravity waves, and then you have long waves. So what we do is we cover all the long waves with ABSERC and we couple tightly to SWAN for the, uh, for the wind waves and, and we just, close our eyes and don't, uh, don't forget to deal with the infragravity waves and say, ah, they're not so important. And, um, and, and so we do have this tight coupling that works quite well. So ADSERC uh, solves for the shallow water equations, 2D, 3D. It's fully 3D your clinic model if you want to make it that way. Uh, but I'll give you a little bit different twist on that. We use Galerk and finite elements, very simple linear elements. And we typically do very large domains. Uh, the, the model is used by the Corps of Engineers to design levees. All the levees in and around New Orleans are designed using ADSERC. Uh, all the post-storm uh, and uh, storm risk studies the Corps, Corps does for hurricanes are done with ADSERC. NOAA has a extratropical and tropical now model called STOS and HTOS. Uh, that uh, is the foundation of it is ADSERC. It's being coupled, coupled to WaveWatch 3, their uh, non-phase resolving wave model as well as to the uh, national water model. And um, so then we have uh, FEMA uh, uses it for flood insurance studies. And so uh, along the whole East Coast, Gulf Coast and Great Lakes Coast, uh, ADSERC is used to establish flood insurance. 
which actually can make me the target of some dislike because if your flood insurance rates are too high, you can, you can blame me. Um, so then we have a SWAN, uh, and that's a non phase resolving uh, wave model from Delft. Uh, it's a great model. It's uh, more focused on the coastal ocean. They have an unstructured rendition that they developed uh, together uh, under a joint project for ONR. And uh, we coupled them very, very tightly. In fact, the uh, parallel uh, communications engines in unstructured version of SWAN are directly out of ADSERC. And uh, basically, ADSERC informs SWAN in terms of water levels and in terms of current speeds. And SWAN gives ADSERC back wave radiation stresses. That's that push that you get when waves break, or it's the pull that you get when waves uh, are being formed and being generated. So they work in these parallel worlds where we try to domain decompose uh, using Parmetus or Metis. And uh, basically we have equisize or equally loaded uh, subdomains, not equisize per se in terms of area, but equally uh, loaded in terms of number of degrees of freedom. And, uh, and again, uh, they, SWAN and ADSERC pass information locally. When you look at wall clock time versus number of cores on the log log plot, you get this uh, linear uh, reduction in uh, runtime, which is what you want. So a typical model might look something like this. It's the East Coast model focused on Southern Louisiana. You see in yellow and orange, the continental shelf, and uh, you see the grid is much larger in the deep ocean than it is on the continental shelf and focusing in on Southern Louisiana you can provide a lot of resolution for let's say southeastern Louisiana, New Orleans here, the Mississippi River, Mississippi River Delta, et cetera. And you can get all the features uh, using the, uh, the finite high resolution finite element grid. So this is a Bathy topo chart. You can see all the river systems, the channel systems, the islands, the levees, et cetera. All that geographic detail is supported by the unstructured grid, which is shown here. And this is a, uh, grid resolution now. And for example, over here, the orange speed is resolved at about two, three kilometers. It goes all the way to five kilometers. The high, uh, high energy conveyances are resolved at 30 to 50 meters. So uh, we, we really try to pack in the high conveyances and we try to put a lot of resolution. So a typical simulation might look something like this. We have uh, Hurricane Gustav winds over here with a, a wind model. Um, and then we have the waves computed with SWAN and the water surface elevations and currents computed with ADSERC. These two models are interacting two-way. The wind model feeds down into the wave and water, uh, uh, shell water models. And so you can see the winds coming up here and um, the hurricane making landfall over here to the west of the Mississippi River. <clears throat> you can see the waves going all the way, um, the slide over here up to significant wave height that's greater than 10 meters, a lot of wave radiation stresses being generated there, and a lot of the storm surge here to the east of the Mississippi River is being trapped by the river on the shallow continental shelf. So kind of an interesting simulation, and, and we do very well simulating this. So obviously we're evolving the capacity, making up for the things that we're missing, and um, the good is, is that we're generating or we're advancing uh, model integration, and part of it is very heterogeneous, and part of it is actually, in some aspects, in terms of numerical drivers, quite homogeneous. And, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, the resolution is getting better. We're understanding better and better how to resolve our grids and where to put our, our, our costs. And we've been working a lot on discontinuous Galerkin methods. Uh, the way to think about discontinuous Galerkin is really a finite element problem on a finite element, a single finite element. And you actually communicate with Riemann solvers between the elements. So it's kind of like finite volume, except that your whole high order stencil is on one element in of itself. So you don't have larger stencils that go across cells. And that's a really, really nice feature. Uh, the bad is, is that uh, the grids are still largely static and uh, the physics is static. We basically decide on the physics beforehand. And uh, the load balancing is less than perfect. And another thing to worry about is falling peak performance on the processors. And you know, a lot of these things are pretty ubiquitous along all, uh, across all modeling communities. So here we have a, uh, what's happening now. So we have, let's say, the wind, shell, water, wave coupling there, but we've coupled now to HICOM. And uh, the way we're using HICOM is really as a internal mode driver 
to the two-dimensional ad search. So NOAA runs HICOM or variants thereof. And so instead of trying to mine the bare clinicity out of, out of our own model, which we can, which would be very expensive because of the high resolution that we use, we actually mine it out of uh, HICOM. And um, let's start this. So the bare clinicity, i.e. The, uh, the temperatures and salinities, they drive all these currents that you're seeing in deep water. And that in turn actually affects the, uh, the surface water at the coast quite a bit. So the two things that we drive with it is we drive these bare clinic currents and we drive internal tide dissipation, which is heavily dependent on the bare clinic structure. And, and that actually is good for us as hurricane modelers because we move the dissipation off the shelf at the shelf rate, and that's a very nice thing. So this is uh, not ad circ, uh, basically computing the what's called the internal mode, it's, uh, it's ICOM. So what you can see is in terms of a monthly mean sea level here, this is in September, and uh, you can see that the water is much higher in the, internal, in the internal part of the ocean. And then the water at the coast is actually quite a bit lower. So all that intra-annual and intra-weekly structure we can capture by feeding and ingesting that bare clinicity from the HICOM model, which is pretty cool. And, and when you match it with the uh, water surface elevations at the coast, it does a really good job. So what's the future? So our vision is to really have much more dynamically coupled models and do it in a much smarter way and actually have them be living and breathing things instead of these static things that we predetermine what we should pick. So we want to have dynamic physics, dynamic grid resolution, dynamic order of interpolants, and to really match this all with and support it with the dynamic load balancing. Focus areas are these frameworks that allow this coupled and dynamic physics to occur um, and to optimize the grids for that physics when we implement it, to have higher order methods and to advance the engines for load balancing. So the, the first thing that we've been doing, and, and this is together with NSEP and NOAA, uh, coupling to the, uh, the uh, Wharf Hydro National Water Model, we're coupling actually for a NOAA project to sea ice as well, as well as Wave Watch 3, which has great ice physics in it. And this we're all doing instead of through our own coupler through ESMF, WAPSI, which uh, from what I understand does have some of the elements and thoughts of DMI in it as well. So, um, so in addition now, so this is pretty heterogeneous coupling, right? Heterogeneous physics and it's heterogeneous grids and models. And so, but on some other things, we actually want to be heterogeneous in the models and the physics, but we want to be uh, homogeneous in the, the actual algorithmic frameworks. So what we're doing now is we're actually growing these algorithmic frameworks that support multiple physics within them. So for example, if you want to get dispersive type waves together with non-dispersive type waves, uh, you're, you're gonna have to make a choice between shallow water equations and Boussinet's class models, right? So if we now want to transcend and go to the infragravity waves and do better, a better job at phase resolving waves, we can actually take a shallow water equation and couple it to a pressure Poisson solver for Boussinet's class model, and that's what we've done. And then we can couple that to the standard shallow water equation model and other portions. So through this interleaving. So the way discontinuous Galerkin works is you actually blow up the elements and you couple them with a Riemann, sol Riemann solver. So for example, some elements you could assign the shallow water equations, and some elements you could assign the shallow water equations plus the pressure Poisson equations that then couple back into those shallow water equations. So it's a very cool mechanism for doing multi-physics within the same computational framework and selecting it when you need it. So for example, when things are calm, you might not want to solve the Boussinesque uh, equations anywhere. When the, the waves get really big and you have infragravity waves being generated, you might want to actually turn on the pressure Poisson solver. And so we've played Andrew Kennedy uh, and some of his and my students have been playing with this for a long time. And uh, there's all, a whole hierarchy of uh, orders of model that you, models and precision that you can generate. And uh, just as a little example here, uh, to do a wave shoaling over this, uh, this berm here, uh, you can match the, the data really well. So it becomes this dynamic type of framework. Next thing is the hydrologic models. So for example, some areas 
in the floodplain, you might want to be actually be solving the kinematic wave and the dynamic wave equations. And so that would be a very important thing to do when you want to have an integrally coupled model. And so over here, you might want to solve the shallow water equations. Next cluster or zone, you might want, might want to solve the Boussinesq class models. And then, for example, in the flat portion of the floodplain, you might want to solve the dynamic wave equations. In the higher portion of the floodplain, the kinematic wave equations. And this is all integrated into the DG discontinuous Galerkin based computational framework. The other thing is, is that we might want to adapt with P. So as I said, we've been living with these second order models. So instead of living with just this simple second order P is equal to one model, let's jump into quadratic elements or cubic elements. And then when things get quiescent again, not as high energy to the uh, linear elements again. The idea is that today's models are basically simply linear models, uh, but they're very high resolution. So let's back off a little bit and, and have coarser models with much higher order interpolants. And, and of course, what the advantage is there, you have a much faster convergence rate. So you're buying convergence speed on the order of the interpolants, plus you're actually allowing yourself bigger time steps and you're allowing yourself or loading up the, uh, the vector-based processors that we have today with much more work. So making, increasing your workload to, towards peak performance. An example is over here, left side is you have high resolution with a uh, channel over here. Here you have this higher order interpolant now and a much coarser mesh if you can see that. And here you have the linear interpolant on the coarser mesh. Of course, this miserably fails in the representation of both the bathymetry and the currents. Here we get identical solutions, but runs four times faster. So we're really mining this. And you can do this in a dynamic way. So when you need that high resolution, you can provide it. So we also have uh, uh, adaptive H uh, networks. So basically add resolution on the fly. And another nice thing about discontinuous Galerkin is you can do it so it's non-conforming. So you don't have to mate with the same interpolant, same type of element, et cetera, as the adjacent element. You can mix, mix and match P. You can mix and match resolution. So we can simply insert more resolution in some elements when we need it. And we can take away that resolution when the flow becomes more quiescent. So an example, kind of a cute example is here. This is a hurricane study of New York Harbor. And uh, post uh, Sandy, we did that study. And it uh, turns out that, for example, this level of resolution is very fine for tides. You do a really good job getting the, the tides right in the whole system. But when the hurricane comes along, there's the Hudson River Canyon that you said, OK, I can see it a little bit there, nuanced and, and uh, smoothed out because of the poor resolution. But it turns out that this is a major release valve for the hurricane. So Hurricane Sandy actually pushed water into New York Harbor by blowing the wind over here. It, the maximum winds just walloped New York Harbor. But because of the depth of that channel, it allows it to be a backflow valve and actually water, lowers the water levels. And the water levels are much higher in New York Harbor if you don't resolve that picture correctly. So we don't want to have this grid just for tides work at a grid, when that storm comes up, then you want to put this level of resolution in. And we can do that with that dynamic H adaptivity uh, when we need it. So of course, all this now has to be accommodated with a uh, framework that allows for uh, changing load balancing. We're changing the, the physics. Some of the physics is much more demanding. Obviously, doing a pressure Poisson solver is much more demanding. Uh, Kinematic and dynamic wave equations are much cheaper than shell water equations. So as we're changing that physics, as we're changing the P's, obviously you're increasing the cost. As we're changing the H's, you're increasing the cost as well. So we're going to have to redistribute and rebalance that whole calculation on the fly. So we've been uh, working with uh, MPI forever, well, I guess the last 15, 20 years. And, um, so we've now turned to a, a piece of code called Zoltan from Sandia National Labs, and it allows us to dynamically redistribute and diffuse locally the elements to be load balanced. <coughs> so the idea is, let's say this is an equal number of, of nodes and elements, uh, domain decomposition. Well, when it's dry, or let's say you're doing the dynamic or kinematic wave equation in this, this uh, land-based area in this calculation, 
and that you, you actually have a much smaller workload. So you can actually put much larger subdomains over there so everything keeps synchronized. And, and that we have developed a lot of technology in order to smartly and intelligently redistribute those workloads. Uh, we're also under an NSF SSI project uh, for uh, software innovation and sustainability. Uh, we're uh, looking at, or we've integrated an HPX with a group at, uh, at LSU. And HPX is a much more fine-grained type of uh, redistribution uh, mechanism. So it really migrates data instead of clusters of the subdomain as we did in the MPI-based sub subdomain decomposition and redistribution. And this is going to be important as we go to larger and larger number of cores to have that greater flexibility uh, and that uh, greater capacity. And it accommodates all those things that we want to change dynamically. So to, uh, to sum up, really, uh, I think uh, that we come for, from years and years of things being pretty static. So you had your geophysical system that then really translated and was supported on this unstructured grid, which was static. And then that went to the PDEs, uh, which in the finite element method, HPC, of course, that was fed by not only the domain, but also by the uh, forcing function and forcing physics. And put that all together, and, uh, uh, and then you basically generate solutions. Uh, there's no feedback mechanism anywhere. So basically, where I think we should be going is having this very, very flexible uh, interactive feedback and that represent, is represented by all those green lines that are basically spaghettiing all over the place and informing things and doing it dynamically. And I think in order to have cheap, effective, and accurate calculations, uh, we need to have that total interaction. I think I'm going to end it there. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Johannes. Questions? Um, I, a lot of the recent hurricane events, um, rainfall flooding was really important yep. in addition to the storm surge. So you said you're working to link with WARF. Is that the approach Warf you Hydro. take? Yep. Yeah, so uh, NOAA has decided that uh, it, as part of their quote unquote national water, total water model, ADSERC is going to do the, the coastal part of it, and uh, Wharf Hydro is going to be the uh, obviously the hydrologic side of it. But then we're working at this interface with them. So, yeah, so right now it's point to point coupling, where I think the vision is, is that uh, the group at Oklahoma is doing that work, is where Wharf Hydro is going to be feeding fluxes into AppCERC. We're actually doing the, uh, the wave, the gridding part of it uh, and providing the grids that go far enough upstream in a really cheap way so that you can couple the rivers far enough. But it used to be no man's land. You're exactly right. And obviously, the downhill, downstream water levels affect things enormously and that adds to the upstream uh, fluxes. So it's really important. Other questions over here? I was just wondering for these uh, problems where you have real bathymetry that is pretty non-smooth, how much do you think it matters to have higher order accuracy methods versus just having good refinement in the region? So uh, we've done a lot of sensitivity studies and uh, obviously critical high conveyance regions are really important. It's a lot of sensitivity. And uh, in general, the near shore seems to be fairly sensitive to uh, you know less than 20 meters. Uh, to what the bathymetry is there, working with different bathy sets. So if you look at some of the global data sets and versus the local uh, LIDAR informed ones that we happen to be lucky enough to have in the United States, the ground uh, water penetrating LIDARs in the back bay and things like that, it really improves things quite a bit. So I think bathymetry is uh, in the conveyance, this is going to be really important where there's a lot of energy, and uh, that's what we're finding. And so, but the, uh, the high order that we're doing there is just to be cheap, just so that we can uh, have lower, bigger elements, right? And uh, larger time steps. And so then we still capture that, that, that physical shape. That's what we're doing that. And by the way, it pays off to have the higher P because uh, you get much more efficiency on the processor and the rivers. 
So it's 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 a matter of cost function. Yeah. Okay. One more, Irina. I I wanted to ask whether you feel that uh, uh, the sediment transport formulations that we use with these models are sufficient for the sort of like unique extreme cases. Uh, like big storm surge events. So, uh, uh, yep, it's important. I, you know, dune systems erode in every major hurricane. Obviously, there's uh, breakthroughs. You have to have that. A, a typical uh, uh, tidal inlet channel will uh, erode by as much as 50% and, and become really deep. So, uh, yes, the morphology is very important. Um, the uh, and, and, and we do have sediment modules, but we haven't played with them as much. Um, I guess it would probably be much easier to get sediment, and, and this is just an educated guess, sediment transport uh, more accurate with uh, high energy events than it would with uh, the, the run a day, work a day morphology. I think uh, I was part of a, a team for the core for a big project called Morphus some years back, and uh, one of the sediment guys uh, made a point that I think when they looked at all the sediment transport formula, that 50% of them, 50% uh, of the data points were within a, no, 80% were within a factor of two and 50%, no, 80% were within a factor of five and 50% were within a factor of two. And of course, the morphology is the uh, gradient of the uh, sediment flux. So it's, um, I think, uh, boy, there's a lot of work to be done. Okay, terrific. Thank you, Johannes.